How's the conference coming along for you? Good so far? Yeah? All right. Awesome. So I would like to start with a little story. This is about 2016, 2017. I ran into an old colleague of mine named Marcus at the office. Uh, this was at a time when you could actually still run into people at the office because they were actually there, right? And not everybody just working from home. So I said, hey, Marcus, how's it going? What's, what's up? What, uh, what are you working on? And he said, um, all good. And uh, we're working on this translation component in our team. And he told me all about uh, what it does and so forth. And I said, huh, that is very interesting. Have you spoken to Stefan? Because I think in his team, they're also working on something like this translation component of some sorts. And he said, in fact, yes, I have spoken to him. And you know what? Uh, so we found out if we both generalize our component a little bit, we can just have one component and we can utilize it both and we would save a lot of time and effort. And I said, that's a great idea. And he told me this because at that time, I was already one of the people running around in the office and advocating inner source because we hadn't implemented any of that at that time yet. So, so I said, oh, awesome, that's great. So how is that working out for you? And he said, well, so we went to our product owners. He went to his product owner, which is a person in uh, one uh, department of the large corporation Mercedes-Benz. And Stefan went to his product owner in another department far over there. And uh, they presented their idea, and the two product owners said, oh, yeah, that, that's actually a really good idea. And I said, okay, good. So how is, how is it uh, coming along? How is it working out? And he said, well, uh, they actually turned us down. They said, no, we, no, it's a good idea, but please don't do it. Why? Well, you know, they said, so we would have to talk to the other team a lot. It would be a big communication overhead all the time. And um, also we have the budget. We don't really need to save money, right? So, uh, okay, wow. And that's, that's not very good, yeah? But so that shows that the, the mindset at the time just wasn't right. The, there was no inner source mindset yet. And also in all fairness, if they had said, yes, let's do it, they would have actually had some problems really implementing it because uh, also our, the legal prerequisites weren't there yet. You know, the, the inner company contracts wouldn't allow such a thing. And also the technological prerequisites weren't there because everybody would develop software on their platform that they like best. And so exchanging code would have been possible, but difficult, right? So, uh, what a dismal situation, but let's see, I would like to show you how we can turn this into a success story and how this would be hopefully totally different today, all right? So, um, inner, we weren't doing inner source at the time, we also weren't doing open source, and a lot of us were advocating inner source and open source, you know, let's do inner source, and while we're at it, let's do open source, because we weren't doing open source either, at least not in an organized fashion. All right, so finally this reached the very top, the senior executives and our CIO, and he said, you know, okay, we have to do inner source and open source. So it was part of our IT, it became part of our IT strategy officially to do inner source and open source. All right, so um, the problems obviously only started then because we didn't really know what we were doing. So uh, we got together all the experts from IT, legal department and uh, research and development and other people. And so at first we found out we don't understand each other, right? So I'm an IT guy, I assume uh, most of you are as well. And uh, you don't speak legalese and the legal people don't speak IT-ish. Um, so one of the first meetings was, was uh, kind of funny. So the, the legal people, they, you know, we met with them and they said, so we understand that you guys want to develop software on our budget, on company budget, and then give it away for free. Clearly, we must have misunderstood because obviously that's not going to happen and that can't, you can't be serious. And he said, 
you know, actually, that's exactly what we want to do. <laughs> they said, wow, really? What? Okay, and we sat down, you know, and we explained it to them why, and, and they understood, and, and so forth. And so we went from there. So it was, it was actually really productive uh, and, and very interesting to try to understand each other. Um, so, beginnings are hard, right? But the first thing, I'm going to outline some of the crucial steps that we took to implement an inner and open source strategy. And the first one is uh, create an internal awareness. You need to make people understand that this is what you need, right? And uh, you, can, you can tell I'm a computer scientist because I start my enumerations with zero, right? Zero, one, two. Okay. Um, so then we had to go. We had to, it's part of the IT strategy. Do it. So the first thing we did is create an OSPO. We didn't call it OSPO at the time yet. It's the FOSS Center of Competence. Um, but essentially, it's uh, what an OSPO is today, right? That's what I mentioned. We got together with people, stakeholders from the various departments and, and talked. And so in case you don't have an OSPO yet at your organization, but you want to convince your bosses, here, there's so many arguments. Here's just, I found this very... Um, I, f I, f I think this really sums it up quite well. Yeah, so whether you know it yet or not, open source is very much at the center of your business. And a centralized open source program office is simply the realization of that reality and the best way to yield the most benefits from open source participation. Um, there were a couple of talks already this morning about OSPOs and there's a to-do group and you can find a lot of resources there. But uh, so here, a, a quick summary of what are the tasks of an, open, of an open source office or open source program office? So it was, in our case, it was part of the IT strategy now, do open source, but what exactly does that mean? Yeah, you have to be um, more clear about it and, and detail it further down what exactly an open source strategy means for the corporation. Then define policy and rules, establish processes and maintain them, um, talk about tools for automation, de development, deployment, then spread the knowledge, um, community management, open source publications, membership in foundation, foundations and external visibility. I will talk about most of these topics in the remainder of the talk. So here's a typical example of an OSPO and that's our OSPO. Um, we have as a, okay, we have some organizational staff at the beginning that help us with uh, organization. <laughs> and then you need governance, obviously, right? Um, when, when you talk about open source, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of licenses involved and you need to pay attention to the licenses and what they say. I think you all know this. Uh, so governance is very important. Uh, they shouldn't dominate the OSPO, in my opinion, and a lot of times in big corporations that can be the case. Uh, for example, you know, the automotive industry is a highly regulated industry, and if you violate things, then there can be very heavy fines. So governance has a very strong say, which is fine, but they shouldn't have the dominating part in an OSPO, I think, because it is an IT topic after all, right? So you need people with technical expertise. You need IT guys, of course. And sometimes overlooked, but very, very important, community management. Yeah. What is a successful open source project? That is an open source project that has a lively community, right? And a lot of people who are interested in a project and then participate and contribute and so forth. And such communities don't just develop out of nothingness. And, you know, a lot of people think, hey, if I have a good project, it will become successful. People will automatically know about it, right? And then I'll have a community. And, yeah, you're laughing. It's, that is obviously not going to happen. So community management is really important. Uh, then we have um, FOSS coordinators in every business stream is how we call it, or every business unit. We have at least one or two, maybe better two FOSS coordinators. So this is a typical multiplier role. They are the number one go-to point of contact for everybody in the business stream if they have questions about open source or inner source. 
and they align with us. So we meet with them regularly, give them the news, what's going on, what are your questions, what are your questions from your department, and so forth, okay? Um, this is simply because we can't handle all the requests by ourselves because it's a big corporation, a lot of people, a lot of questions, yeah? So this is a very successful thing. And this is a community in itself, by the way, the, the, the uh, FOSS coordinators, because so we, when we first you know, started this with the coordinators, um, they would ask us all the questions. And now we have a, you know, Teams on Microsoft Teams. Uh, and now they ask questions and another coordinator a lot of times answers the question. Yeah? And so they do this themselves also. We don't always have to step in. So that's really good. It really helps you. All right. Second, embrace FOSS. In our strategy, we said we wanted to embrace FOSS. What does that even mean? Okay, so we had to first think about what exactly is embracing FOSS. So here, um, FOSS, obviously, very quickly here, um, you use open source software. Um, um, keep in mind that even a company who doesn't, maybe doesn't use open source software in their own development, Maybe they buy third-party software that contain open source uh, components. So that is also use, okay? So I think these days everybody does this. Use, then maybe you want to contribute something back to an open source project, or maybe you want to create or publish your own open source projects, okay? So these are the three stages. And embrace FOSS, I think it's kind of obvious, means all of this plus more, and now we'll get to the more. Okay, this is the very good start, but really embracing has more to it, and I'll show you this. Let me just briefly uh, say something about usage of open source. I mean, I realize I'm at an open source conference, so I'm probably, you probably have heard this before. So here the synopsis open source uh, security and risk analysis report. If you don't know it, I recommend that you take a look because it's quite interesting. Uh, they, f they looked at 2,400 code bases and they found that 97% of these code bases contained open source. Uh, synopsis, these are the people that, that uh, bring you black duck, right? Okay, so maybe th this, the, the, the code bases are a bit biased as well, possibly, but it's still going to be a lot, even if it's less than 97%. And they found that 78% of the code itself was open source code. All right, so that's huge. And they, uh, they divide it further down into uh, various sectors of industry. And here, this is us, aerospace, aviation, auto, transportation, and logistics. And the number here, 97% is the same, but uh, they said here only 60% of the only, 60% yeah, of the code was open source. They also, by the way, found that 60% uh, of the code had open source vulnerabilities. Yeah, this is completely not the scope of this talk, but it's something to keep in mind, something really important. You don't want to ignore this 60% vulnerabilities. You all know what this can do, right? Uh, okay, so. Now, use open source is kind of a no-brainer, but what about contribute or create or publish? Yeah, create and publish. Um, you can say, well, you know, we use so much open source software in our development, it would be nice if we contributed back something here and then. You know, it's about giving back. We're a big corporation. We don't want to be freeloaders only. Yeah? Okay, so giving back is nice, but um, it's the right thing to do, yeah? But you know what? When the economic times get tough, nice things, being nice, or especially it's the right thing to do and giving back are the first things that get dropped. Okay, so why does it still make sense that even in tough economic times, you invest your time to contribute back? And along comes here, this guy, Frank Nagel, he's a professor at the Harvard Business School. And he did an extensive study that, uh, very well done, I think. And uh, it, he found that companies who contribute back benefit monetarily twice as much as compared to companies who only use open source, right? They benefit twice as much. Why? Because 
when you contribute, you go through a feedback process, right? Your code contribution or any contribution is reviewed and then maybe a discussion goes on back and forth. And your engineers are going to learn a lot because they are talking now to the brightest and best developers out there. And this is like a continual internal, continuous internal training program for your own engineers. And this is also, this is not just a one-time effect only that you know, occurs at the beginning when you start getting involved in open source. This keeps on giving and it just continues. All right, so here, now this is a really hard reason. This is a really good reason then you can show to your senior executives, hey, look at this study. We benefit so much more if we also contribute back, All right? Don't drop it in tough, tough economic times. All right, so um, two years ago, we, so this guy here behind me, this is Jan Brecht. He's the CIO of Mercedes-Benz. And uh, once a year, he gathers all his senior managers in IT. And, you know, they get together for two days and they talk about IT strategy and important things. And uh, two years ago, we, we had a, a slot, a, work, a little workshop slot for FOSS. And so we wanted... At the time, it was already part of the strategy, but there were still quite a few managers out there who were like, yeah, you know, it, okay, sounds good, but I'm not sure exactly why I should do this and um, what's the point and so forth. Um, so we did this little video. It's uh, two minutes long. I'm going to show it to you. This just, you know, why should you embrace FOSS? Okay, here we go. So why should you embrace FOSS in your team? Well, for one, he really likes FOSS, so you can make him happy. But that shouldn't be the real reason behind it. Let me give you some pointers. Innovation nowadays happens to a large degree in the FOSS domain. Therefore, doing FOSS can speed up our access to innovative technologies to be at the forefront where automotive goes digital. Second, with FOSS, we are achieving a much higher efficiency in software development. It fosters reuse and it's cheaper and easier on your engineer. You save yourself time and money and you can go faster and faster. And this will give us the freedom to focus even more on our USPs. Also, it's in your own best interest. By being active in FOSS and not only use it, you can steer open source projects in the direction you need them. Contributions are the currency of open source. It is how you provide influence to the project your business depends on. And what's even more, our FOSS endeavors help us to attract new talent. We need software engineers. That's a fact. And they are attracted to open source like a moth to a flame. Trust me on this. Plus, Participating in open source is like a continuous internal training program for the engineers that we already have, as has been proven in Harvard's study. Our engineers will learn and get better and better. And this isn't a one-time effect only, which merely occurs at the beginning. The advantages of the learning process will keep going on over and over and over again. Well. I can think of at least 10 more good reasons why you should be active in FOSS. Bottom line is, for software development, FOSS is like the air you breathe. You need it, and that's all there is to it. So please, open. Open up as much as you can, because it makes us all so much better. Okay, so <laughs> thanks for the smiles. Um, the, you, can, you can rely on the fact that the, the uh, managers still remember this. They don't maybe remember all of the things I said, but they remember it as such. And then, you know, they can go back to, hey, wait, there was this video with this guy with the endless cup. And <laughs> so uh, in case you weren't able to pay attention to everything I said, here, these are all the points summarized. <laughs> Yeah, people told me, you know, I like your video, but I had to watch it twice, you know, because I couldn't pay attention the first time to what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, 
Okay, so here, all the benefits in case you need to convince someone. So, we had fuzz in our strategy, we convinced the senior managers, and, but still, we felt that something was missing. People were not doing it as much yet, and uh, also, th there was a bit of uncertainty. So, engineers would ask, so, but can we now, can we contribute back to open source? Is it okay? Can we publish our own open source projects? Because a few years before, uh, that wasn't the case. We weren't allowed to do that, right? So, what we did is we created the Mercedes-Benz FOSS Manifesto. So, namely, a colleague uh, of mine and myself, we sat down together and we wrote up these, these rules and guidelines um, to proclaim the importance of free and open source software for a modern tech organization. So, the FOSS Manifesto has three parts, preamble, company principles, employee principles. And the goal is to facilitate the change, uh, the cultural change, basically, because that's the most difficult part, usually. All right, so let me show it to you. Oh, yeah, maybe it can serve as an example for other companies. I'll get to that. So here's the preamble. The uh, preamble is sort of a solemn note to set the stage. And it says here, this comes from the FOSS Center of Competence and also the CIO. So that means, you know, it's actually valid. You can rely on it. And our CIO, he in turn showed it to the board of management of Mercedes-Benz and Ola Keleni is the CEO, and they endorsed it as well, which is important, you know, because you can't make claims about how employees can use their working time, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, without having C-level involvement, right? And also, so a lot of managers came to us and said, hey, wait a minute, you can't say this. I mean, did every manager on every level endorse this? And I said, no, but Ola Kelenius, our CEO, he endorsed it. I think it's valid. And they go, oh, okay, good, yeah, fine. Okay, so here, these are the company principles. Um, they give the expectations of the company for our engineers. So. Mercedes-Benz shall support and encourage the employees to use, contribute to, and create FOSS projects both in open and inner source endeavors. I realize that FOSS projects and inner source is kind of contradictory, but that was the best wording that we found <laughs> So, uh, to, in order to not make it too complicated. Mercedes-Benz shall allow the o appropriate time for its employees to participate in FOSS activities. So can I, can I take the time? Can I do it on company time? Yes, of course you can. You know, please do it. So it doesn't only allow the engineers to do it, it actually sends them on the mission to do exactly that. Um, Mercedes-Benz shall encourage and facilitate learning advancement of its employees through FOSS. I think that doesn't really need any explanations. You know, go to a conference maybe, uh, maybe give a talk even. And, uh, and so take the time to, to grow and learn with FOSS. And then promote the visibility in open source communities for example, be, become part of foundations. I'll get to that in a moment as well. Here are the employee principles. So an engineer shall look for inner, for open and inner source alternatives before writing custom code or using proprietary alternatives. So this says FOSS first, right? Before you invest time and money in something else, look if there isn't already something out there. Um, you shall, as an engineer, be active in inner source, and you shall contribute to open source projects within the scope of the day-to-day -day work. Okay, so here you have it. Please be active in open source and in inner source. And then here, this number four is sort of a mini code of conduct. Um, remember that how you behave in open source will reflect back on the entire company, so be nice. Okay, that's essentially that. All right. Um, where can you find the FOSS manifesto? It is on our open source landing page, opensourcemercedesbenz.com, and here in the top right corner, there's the manifesto. You can read it, and the FOSS manifesto itself is open source, which means we have put it under the least restrictive license, a Creative Commons Zero license. There's a, it points to a GitHub repository. You can take this, maybe as a blueprint for your own FOSS manifesto, if you think that's something that your company might like. Uh, you can alter it in any way you like. You can add things, change things, and you don't have to credit us. It's yours to use, 
okay? And so some companies have already followed suit. Um, a couple of months ago, the Continental AG, not the airline, but the, you know, the automotive company, it's one of the biggest automotive companies in the world, they have adopted it um, based on, on this here, and you just you know, change it according to their company. Uh, and last week, Siemens announced publicly they have published the Siemens FOSS manifesto. So that is really cool. Hopefully, maybe more companies will take it over. I have heard rumors of a few more, and so I'm curious to see. I, so the point here is, I hope that this can really help advance FOSS in the industrial world in big companies or small companies, right? Okay, uh, train your employees. Now, once you have all these FOSS processes in place, you need to tell your employees about them. And so we have created a few uh, trainings. Um, I realize there are a lot of trainings, for example, of the Linux Foundation that are quite useful. But here, these trainings, they're uh, with Mercedes-Benz specifics, you know, in, in um, terms of rules and guidelines and legal and compliance to company, company rules. Okay, so we have the awareness training. That's very basic. It just says what is FOSS and why. Everybody in IT has to take this. And every engineer in IT who does software development has to do the use training. Tells you about you know, license compliance and what to take uh, into consideration and so forth. And then when you contribute to other projects, here are some additional rules and what is community management and so forth. So that's here. And then create if you publish your own. And lastly, we have a, a training about inner source. On top of that, we have a FOSS wiki, which uh, isn't an actual wiki in the sense that anybody can change every sentence because some of these have legal um, reference, references and, and, and importance. So, but it's like our number one go-to source for all things related to open source. Yeah. So foundations and sponsorships. So we are members of a few foundations. For example, we're strategic members of the Eclipse Foundation. And we have recently joined the Software Defined Vehicle Working Group within the Eclipse Foundation, also strategic members. And this is a great example of how open source, how big corporations can benefit from collaboration with other industry uh, companies in open source. So this is... There's Volkswagen is there and Microsoft and, uh, and Bosch and uh, lots of others. I think we're now, I'm not sure if we're at 100 members yet. Sorry, I don't want to say anything wrong, but it's, it's taking up a big momentum, big speed. And you know, imagine we can't talk to Volkswagen about everything, but we can talk to them in open source about everything related to open source. Yeah, and so this is, we want to develop things together that, you know, say stuff that everybody needs and that is, doesn't have a competitive advantage. And so develop together in open source, right? And so there are a lot of, not just automotive companies, by the way, I, I mentioned Microsoft and there's a, a lot of others. Okay, so this is a really great example how FOSS can, can and will benefit big companies like that as well. Compete where necessary or where appropriate and work together where you can, right? Without violating anything antitrust related because open source, public knowledge. Very good. We're also members of the Linux Foundation. We're members of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I think that, so these foundations, they're doing great work in open source. We have also, here's another thing where we try to give back and that is uh, sponsoring. So we financially sponsor uh, projects through GitHub sponsors. So that means we, if you go to our, if you go to uh, github.com slash Mercedes-Benz, you can see something like this, Mercedes-Benz is sponsored. Uh, 34, I think right now, currently the number is a little bit lower because some sponsorships have expired. Uh, we're right now in the process of, of doing the next round of sponsoring. So if you check back in a few weeks, it should uh, have a significantly larger number. Okay. Um, so sponsoring open source, it is about appreciation and giving back, but it's also, a, you know, it helps to ensure that the projects that we like, we rely on that they will still be around tomorrow. 
So it is in your own best interest to do this, right? Um, so I think it's actually a great thing. We get phenomenal feedback from the community. And it's, it's not even just the money. You know, most people are happy when you give them free money, but it's also the appreciation. So we get feedback like, hey, wow, I am overwhelmed by, I didn't even know Mercedes-Benz is using my project and now you're, you're doing this and you're giving me money and thanks so much. Yeah. Um, it gives me the kick to continue working on this open source project. Thank you for the recognition. And uh, one, one person said, hey, um, we, we wanted to sponsor them and they didn't have a, a sponsor's profile set up yet. And so we said, hey, if you set up a sponsor's profile on GitHub, we can sponsor you. And then like a couple of months later said, hey, thanks we, uh, for the money, but also like 10 other companies are sponsoring us now. So it kind of worked out for them. Uh, let's see how this is working. You know, um, I think if more and more companies do this, then it can really help to make open source more sustainable. We all know the stories about, um, you know, overworked maintainers that do this as a side project for free. And, and, and that's not right. That's not sustainable, right? And so if more and more companies do this and everybody contributes a little bit, then I think that can help a lot and we can change, we can change the open source world. I'm serious. All right. Um, let me see how we're we doing time-wise. We have until... 15? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, good. Um, I have a couple more slides. It will take me two minutes to finish up, but let me take questions maybe uh, now if you have any questions. Okay, and then I'll just finish up very quickly. Yes? Say thanks for sponsoring the oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sponsoring the FIPS certification for OpenSSL 3.0. Yeah. There's a lot of people who are going to benefit from that work. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Here's a question over there. From an organizational standpoint, how connected is your OSPO to some of the functional groups like procurement and HR and security and so on? Uh, so we are talking to each one of these that you mentioned for various reasons. So HR, and, okay, we're talking to each of these departments, but the collaboration is not yet where we want it to be. So for example, HR, one of the reasons why we do open source is, you know, it attracts talent because, you know, a, a software engineer is not going to work at a company where they can't do open source. Yeah. So ideally, Maybe we would have a booth down there. Uh, uh, we are recruiting, you know, so I can refer you to them. So that's not there yet. We did have that at KubeCon, though. Uh, but so we, we, we do talk to HR. Then comms department, of course, uh, procurement as well, because when we do sponsorings, you know, that goes through procurement. Yeah, uh, so we talk to all of them. And it's, it's getting better and better, yeah. At first, of course, it was a bit difficult because there was the understanding of open source wasn't there yet, but it's now that is completely there. Yeah. Okay. Hi. You talk about compete where possible and collaborate where possible. Do you guys have sort of centralized decision about what is your competitive advantage versus what you can collaborate on, or is that on a per manager? they decide sort of what sort of strategy do you have to manage that? Yeah, problem? okay. So as far as I know, um, there are certain things where it's clear that this is, you know, competitive. For example, autonomous driving. You know, we're not going to share our algorithms on open source for autonomous driving. Yeah. And the others, like, for example, what's part of the software defined vehicle working group, we, this is discussed on a case to case basis, Be, you know, so here, this is commodity. Everybody uses it. It's no secret. So, you know, yeah. So it's some things are clear, some things are not clear, and then have to be discussed. Also, when you publish something as open source, somebody has to, you know, for at least for I better more uh, principle to is this something that we want to give away or not? Right? Okay. And I should mention that uh, my example from the two product owners at the beginning, this wouldn't happen anymore today. Today they would say. 
that's a great idea. We can make a cool inner source project out of it. You know, we have the prerequisites, technical, legal, and the mindset is there. So almost forgot, this is the success story. Okay. And uh, now time-wise, I think you can obviously find me right after in the hallway as well, uh, or tomorrow even. Um, ending up with here, have fun. I think this is a really important component. So uh, we had a little FOSS conference at Mercedes-Benz and afterwards we took the people to the Mercedes-Benz Arena in Stuttgart, where our headquarters is, you know, and just gave them a tour. That was nice. Uh, here, this is us at KubeCon, uh, three weeks ago, KubeCon in Amsterdam. And uh, we were awarded the end user award from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. That was really cool. So we celebrated that. Yeah, that's, that's me right there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, here we did a little video with GitHub that you will be able to see in a few weeks uh, with involving robots. That was, that was good fun. And uh, this here, uh, so during pandemic, this is at the FOSS Backstage Conference uh, that took place only online. I think this was 2020 uh, or 2021. And by the time I had gotten sick of watching online talks all the time, right? And so I was like, okay, I mean, I'm going to have to do something so people will watch my talk. So I dressed up as a pirate and I gave a pirate talk with all the props. You know, I had a bottle of rum and some gold and things like that. And I think it's still the most watched talk from that conference here. So that was a lot of fun, you know. I didn't ask my comms department. Like, I, I mean, I gave them the slides, but I didn't tell them I was going to dress up as a pirate. Maybe I shouldn't say that now here. Am I on video? No, but so it, it was so much fun, seriously. All right, so that's it. Um, oh, uh, one thing I should mention, we're hiring, in case you are interested, right? So here is a, um, a QR code, and here is Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation. That's, a, where, that's my home base, 100% IT subsidiary of Mercedes-Benz. We're hiring, we're the IT techie guys. And the mother company, Mercedes-Benz AG, of course, is hiring as well. All right, so if you're interested, here, go to these websites. And then, thank you. And, uh, May there always be wind in your sails. Thanks very much. <laughs>